Hey, it's Philbert here, and I want to talk about an era I call the Dark Age of PC gaming. And I view this starting around 2002 and ending around 2013. Essentially, it faded out with the eighth generation of consoles, the Xbox One, the PS4. There are a few reasons I kind of feel this way about this like decade of PC gaming. And it comes down to about three key things, which I'm going to break into more detail. But to highlight them, the first and probably biggest reason is piracy. Uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, pirating, PC games got easier and easier as stuff got more accessible. Internet speeds got uh, faster across the country so people could download bigger games quicker. And the industry just had a huge backlash to this. Uh, digital media management, otherwise known as DRM, started to be implemented in pretty intrusive ways with some games. And some companies just stopped releasing on PC for a while. They just forego the market. The second reason is around this time in the uh, millennium, if you're playing on PC, you almost certainly were playing on Windows systems. And we transitioned from MS-DOS and Windows 9X based operating systems to most people, Windows XP, which was Windows NT based. And what this meant was the architecture of the operating system was different. So you started to run into compatibility issues. And as the 2000s went on, it became harder to play some games you might have bought in the uh, 90s, particularly MS-DOS games. And I do think uh, even today, one of the hardest uh, eras to play games that came out on PC were any game that came out in the late 90s, early 2000s. You almost always got to do some type of virtual machine or hope that game got some type of uh, remaster or was real or can run in like DOS box. Finally, and perhaps the most controversial opinion of mine is there was a console first game design with a lot of developers and games at this particular period. What I mean by that, and I'm going to go into more detail. I want to point out some of this is obviously speculation, but there's clearly evidence of games that came out on PC that were in awful states or had very bad choices. One of the most infamous, for example, of what I mean is Resident Evil 4. Awesome GameCube game. Uh, when it came to PC, we got the PS2 port, which almost everyone considers the inferior port. But you couldn't aim with the mouse. You, When you would like aim the gun, you use the arrow keys. And luckily, that is no longer an issue. Further versions of that game came out for PC even before the remaster of 4 came out. But there is instances of that with controls, with settings, with uh, frame rate locks, uh, restrictions imposed on PC games and ports or settings and options that we were used to and accustomed to having prior being taken away. Now, I want to give a little bit of background about myself so you specifically understand two things. Some, what my bias might be when I went through this period as well as just my perspective. So you know how I view this time, my age range and everything. Uh, so to start with that, I'm 34. I was born in 1989. So this period I'm talking about, I would have been like 12 to 23, 24. And you can gauge like my maturity when I was going through this time. Most of like the when this era first started, what I consider the dark age and like 2000. 2002, 2003, 2004, I was still too young to really be analytical of the industry and think too much what was going on. This, a lot of this opinion I formed obviously came later in life. That said, I've always played games on console first. I want to get ahead of this before we get too far in the video. This isn't like a console wars or PC master race issue. You can see I have a ton of GameCube games, my most nostalgic console. I have a PS5. I play and have always played games on consoles. Uh, I just prefer PC, and PC is my main platform to play on. So I grew up uh, playing games on the NES and Super Nintendo. Our first computer was a 
Packard Bell Legend. It had Windows 3.1. It had some of those classic built-in games, Ski Free, Jetpack, uh, Snake. We also it came with those edutainment games. If you're a little bit older like me or even older, you might remember stuff like 3D Dinosaur Adventure, 3D Body Adventure, Space. And those were awesome games that really brought me into PC gaming, especially in that period, seeing games like that compared to what you might be playing console was a big reason I started to focus on PC games. And like one of the first games I got for Windows 3.1, which I didn't get many that didn't come with it, was a game called Mega Race. Can you keep up this level of intensity, tough guy? Or have you given your all in one spectacular race? Viewers, if you're watching the repeat, please don't phone in to tell me the answer. I hate it when they ruin the suspense. Kind of a TV car combat game. I don't think it's a very good game. It's very nostalgic to go back to. It's the first game I ever heard a swear word in, and me and my brothers thought that was awesome. Uh, but as the 90s continued, I got a Windows 98 computer, or our family got one. My uncle, who is very tech savvy, worked in the Air Force, had built us a Windows 98 computer. I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, he clearly pirated about a dozen or 15 games and put them on the system. They all had like no CD cracks. And I'm actually super thankful and happy he did this because a lot of them were classics. We're talking like World of Warcraft 2, Red Alert. He had like Sim Farm on there. Uh, Quake was on there. And some just random ones like there's one called Big Red Racing, this like really bad racing game, uh, Magic School Bus. So uh, there is a bunch of uh, classic games. And a huge variety of games. So you had, you know, first person shooters, RTS games, simulation games. And that again started to open me up more to PC gaming. And as the nineties went on, uh, and I started to get in late uh elementary school and middle school, I had two friends in particular who played almost all their games on PC as well. And we started to trade games. Especially we got real big into the Maxis games. A lot of the classics like SimCity 2000, The Sims. Uh, we even played all the janky ones, Streets of SimCity, SimCopter. And we got into a bunch of other like uh, tycoon games. Uh, we started to play games online together like Red Alert 1, Red Alert 2. And it just it popped into my head, just talk about Windows 98. One of the first games I got for Windows 98, I don't remember how I got it, but was a game called Time Commando. And I just bring this up because, like the swear word, uh, this was the first game I've ever seen nudity in. Granted, it was uh, boobs on a marble statue within the game, but I still, like, the first time I seen that, I was like, holy crap, I ran past that scene because I didn't want, like, my mom or dad to walk by the computer because I knew they would not be happy I would have been eight, nine uh, when that occurred. As the millennium transitioned, uh, again, PC was really my main platform. I would still play like PlayStation 1 at friends' houses or PS2 and 64. I had a 64 at the time. So, yeah, as the millennium continued, I still played a lot of console games. Uh, but yeah, me and my friends were playing stuff like Resonation, Shogun Total War, Never Winter Nights. And specifically as high school started is one at the time I started to notice what I now consider aspects of like the dark age of PC gaming influencing games. And in high school, one of the things I remember the most was the Call of Duty games. The first two Call of Duty games when they came out, especially, you know, I'm target demographic. I'm like 14, 15 at the time playing World War II shooters, and this was a heyday for World War II shooters. And me and my friends love them. We'll play them online. And then Call of Duty 3 comes out. And even though the first two Call of Duties were PC games, the third one was console exclusive. Luckily, for if you're a Call of Duty fan, uh, after that, they started to come back to PC. But that was the first time I remember being like, like, what the heck? Like, how are they not just releasing the game on computer? Like, the first game was like a hit on computer, right? Almost only knew the first game as a PC game. 
other series would kind of do stuff like this at that time. Like the Battlefield series had like Battlefield 2 Modern Combat come out only on consoles. But to be fair, they went with a little bit of like the hybrid of like console only game and then their multi-platform game. But we also got games like, you know, Halo and Halo 2 came out on PC, but then Halo 3 never did. And granted, the first two Halos were delayed on PC by like two years. But still, the first Halo, I remember all my friends loved it on Xbox. I never had an Xbox. Then I was able to borrow a copy of Halo for PC back in like 2004 and had a blast. Uh, but yeah, it took years then for Halo 2 to come to, to PC. And again, 3 never came to PC until the Ma Master Chief Collection like a decade later. So I'm just trying to point out some high-level examples. I'm not trying to go through every uh, instance this might have happened. I'm just... My point right now is during like my high school years is one used to have these high-profile games often that were coming out on PC start to get huge delays or just not come out on PC at all. Which gets me to the first part of this video. Piracy. Now, piracy has always been an issue with all media. Video games, movies, music, etc. I do want to state a famous Gabe Newell quote, the founder of Valve, who said, quote, we think there is a fundamental misconception about piracy. Piracy is almost a service problem, not a pricing problem. End quote. Now, there's always going to be people who take the free route. I and almost all my friends in college used to sail the seas to play games, get movies, music, whatever. But usually as you get older, and especially as you get like a steady income, piracy goes down. When you have a convenient and fair way to purchase a product, you almost... All the vast majority of people will go that route. And when it came to PC games, the earliest example of PC games, you could just install the game and play, which led to companies and developers starting to make uh, methods to prevent people from doing just one person buying a game and sharing it around, especially as the internet started to take off where you could, you know, share and download games, which brings us back to DRM digital rights management so in the late 80s and early 90s games would come with like a lot of physical products sometimes it would be like little decipher puzzles but more often than not it would be like a little book notebook and the game at startup or even during gameplay would have you reference this at some point so you'd have to go and look it up on the physical uh product you had and a lot of these products were made in ways where it was very hard to like, uh, photo scan them to share them that way and that worked well enough but again that was still pretty uh intrusive and i'm sure I, i'm too young to know but i'm sure a lot of people back then <laughs> didn't like that but as the 90s again started to progress you had cd-roms come out and a pretty simple and viable solution, which came with CD-ROMs, was CD keys. And games, even today, almost all have a key associated with it. If you buy a digital game, you should get a digital key. You link it to like your uh, Steam or other online store. But back then, your CD key would be printed on the back of the jewel case or on the back of the uh, instruction booklet in the jewel case. And those games almost always during install would ask for a CD key. You typed it in, it ran against an algorithm. As long as it satisfied it, you could launch and play the game. And that was a pretty good way to handle DRM at the time. A lot of games in the 90s too often required the CD to be in the CD-ROM. That way you can just go and sell it at a friend's house and then take the disc. But some games you still could do that. But again, uh, technology developed. Uh, you started to see people come out with no CD cracks. So me and my friends in the late 90s, when we learned about this, it made sharing games so much better because you could just install the game, run a no CD crack, which would edit files where the, uh, when you launch the game, it would assume the uh, CD was in the tray and you could play. Internet speed also developed as the 90s went on and the 2000s started because early games uh cd-rom if you had 
a 700 megabyte game on that disc, that would take hours, maybe days for someone to download over the internet, which was a huge deterrent. And especially in a time when being on the internet meant you had to take up a phone line with dial up. But as internet speeds improved, you could now download games much quicker within hours, within minutes even. And that really started to hamper how useful this type of DRM was. Also, I didn't touch on it yet, but you could usually find cracks to get around uh, the CD-ROM algorithm, or some installs would just bypass it completely with piracy. This led to what a lot of people consider the most intrusive type of DRM, and that was games that required always online connections, games that would check even if you're it's a single player game they'll check every 10 days or sometimes every 15 minutes with a server and if it failed that check you would not be able to play the game i have a few firsthand examples of all of this happening during this period so the original mass effect i got on pc this is a game that was released november 20th 2007 uh, it had a version of Secure ROM that limited the number of installs you could do. So when you'd install this game, it'll do an internet check to a server. And if you had installed it too many times, you could not continue. And that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, after I graduated high school, I got a gaming laptop and I went to uh, college for IT. And of course, like any IT student, I was constantly reinstalling my operating system because I was breaking it, trying new operating systems, whatever. And I often would always install Mass Effect because it was one of my favorite games at the time. Well, Mass Effect 2 is coming out. I go to install Mass Effect 1 to replay it through it one more time. And I run into the infamous error. And it popped up stating this project has been activated too many times. Now, luckily for me, I was able to contact EA. I don't remember exactly. It was either through a phone call or a chat, but I'm fairly sure it was through a phone call there's a number i had to call and talk to an agent and they were able to allow my key to have five more installs so i could install the game and play it but still that is insanely intrusive and frustrating and you shouldn't be needing to call or contact a company to install your product other games at this time i played that had very intrusive drm uh, Spore, when it came out on PC, it would do a check every 10 days. And if you didn't, if it couldn't check, you couldn't play. And this was actually an issue for me because I grew up in the country. Uh, I always tell people I graduated with 39 kids in a public school. I had more Amish who lived on my block than people with power. Point is, we had awful internet. We had dial up until like 2009 while when I was in college. And just constant internet was not always an option for me. So I would go through periods of 10 days where I might never connect to internet and I couldn't play the game. So I would have to find a way to get online just to do this verification check. Uh, Splinter Cell Blacklist was another firsthand example of game that I played and it did checks every 15 minutes. And at this time, when I was living at home, we had satellite internet and it was got so slow because it had like a three gig data cap that the checks would fail and i would play the game and 15 minutes in it would fail the check because our internet was that bad and i just was not able to play the game and obviously this is frustrating at the time but this is also clearly frustrating because these checks are being done against servers if those servers go down you can't play other games such as really at the tail end of the Dark Age, a game like uh, SimCity 2013, you would had to log on to play that game even if you're playing single player and the servers, especially at launch, would go down. But you run into this issue if the servers aren't up, you can't play. And what if these companies go out of business and now you lost access to your game? Thankfully... Almost every time a company has implemented DRM like this, after a year or two, they do remove it. But it's so bullshit you had to deal with it in the first place. Now, I would like to focus on the year 2007 specifically. Uh, I was going into my senior year of high school, and I was watching E3 and G4. And they're covering 
of course, all the big companies, but I was particularly interested in Microsoft because, again, as a PC gamer, a lot of their games, even though they're coming out on Xbox 360, uh, Microsoft released games on both systems. Even stuff like Halo that would come out on original Xbox would eventually come out to PC. So I'm watching this press conference, specifically a Microsoft one, and it was exciting because the consoles had been out for a year now, the new generation, which often, especially in this period, would give like more life to some of the developers. And 2007 had some bangers. Uh, you had Assassin's Creed, the first one announced. Halo 3, Forza Motorsports 2. You had New Ace, Com new Ace Combat. You had uh, The Lost Odyssey, Crackdown, The Darkness, Uncharted, God of War 2. And, uh, of course, some of those aren't Microsoft games, uh, like God of War. But you had all these big games announced. And Microsoft specifically, I still remember, they were like, all these games will be out by holiday of 2007. And it's like, awesome. So many awesome games I'm going to be able to play. Uh, except all of those didn't come out to PC. <laughs> so you had the new Assassin's Creed specifically uh, Assassin's Creed, Halo, Forged and Mortar Sports, Ace Combat, are all games which did not come out PC at that time, but since do come out on PC. All the new Assassin's Creed's released on PC, the Forza games released on PC, etc. Other games like Uncharted, God of War, obviously don't necessarily come out to P That was a pipe dream back then, but even those games, uh, most Sony games released on PC now, Granted, usually like a year or two after, but they still release. And I do think a lot of this was a backlash to piracy, where you started to run into games going earlier in the video, games like Call of Duty, that these developers didn't want to release on PC because they would see that their game got pirated like a, a million downloads, and they only got uh 500,000 sales or something. So they would just lose motivation and just forego PC completely. Which I understand the company is frustrating, but also as someone who enjoys video games and was a big gamer on PC at this time, it's also extremely frustrating to see specifically like new IPs being announced that you can't play because you don't have the right console. Luckily, one of the things that really started to take off later into the 2000s was whether you love it or hate it is online marketplaces like steam epic ubisoft connect uh ea store origin as it used to be known did um multiple things but one of the big things was they acted as a form of drm one thing about pc games that a lot of these companies couldn't ignore as well is how big the market has gotten in 2022 the PC gaming was a $38.2 billion industry. Now, that still was smaller to consoles of that same year, which were $51.8 billion, but PC gaming by no means is niche. And when you're talking about billions of dollars, that's too much money to leave on the table and ignore. So I think with the market always building in PC gaming and it literally being the billions, as well as new utilities and tools for these developers to use, such as online storefronts, whether it was a third party like Valve or they would release their own like EA and Ubisoft have done. It gave gave them the tools to finally release games and allow access to them. And you, I think you've seen really a lot of these markets and a lot of companies start to come back to the PC gaming market as the 2010s went on which is part of the reason why I kind of put the end of the Dark Age around 2013 with that eighth generation of consoles coming. So the next aspect of the Dark Age of PC gaming is moving away from MS-DOS and Windows 98 or 9X systems. As I stated at the top, a big a highlight of Microsoft and just PC gaming in general is backwards compatibility. You're able to run and play older software. Granted, it's not always 100%. It's never promised to be 100%, but that's often, it, it's 
really taken until like the eighth, ninth, ninth generation of consoles to really embrace backwards compatibility, which was often a feature with uh, PC gaming. As I mentioned at the start, you have MS-DOS and Windows 9X systems, and Windows 9X systems are like a hybrid DOS system. I'm not going to tell the technical details, but Windows moved to a new file system, NTFS, and my, Windows XP was the first operating system pushed to consumers to really uh, go to this new architecture. And again, not going into all the details that's on the point of this video, it just meant that some software, and particularly games, didn't run well if they were designed on that old file system and the old architecture to run on the new. Uh, plenty still did. I played a ton of Windows 98 games on Windows XP, but you would. this was the era where going back five years, you would a lot of times run into bugs or hiccups or you wouldn't be able to install the game. And it got worse as the 2000s went on. Uh, trying to play a game that came out in 1999 on PC on a Windows 2003 XP computer, often you probably could. Once it starts hits like 2007, it would get harder. And especially as Vista and Windows 7 came out, it got even harder. And I still think it's often is incredibly hard to play that like five year period of like 97 to 2002 uh, PC games on modern hardware without doing some type of virtual machine. Now, a great thing that took off as the 2000s continued was you had utilities. One of the best is DOSBox that runs a virtual DOS. So playing MS-DOS games on modern systems is actually incredibly easy for the most part. Often you can just find pre-built uh, DOSBox configurations to play the games. Online store marketplaces like Google Old Games, GOG, or even things like call Zoom Platform, I know is one as well, that re-released older games, uh, often DRM-free, GOG is always DRM-free, that are designed to be played on newer hardware. And sometimes those games like come pre-packaged with like DOSBox that they launch in. You've also just seen technology develop. Uh, if you play games on PC, surely you know the term, even if you don't know what it means, DirectX. So currently we have DirectX 12. DirectX was developed in the 90s and is essentially just a group of APIs to interact with multimedia in games. In a nutshell, it just gives structure and organization for software to interact with the operating system. If you go back to like DOS, especially early DOS, there are some games that were designed specifically for certain CPU speeds. So if you played the game on faster hardware or newer hardware, it would run too fast because it was doing checks like at the computer or the CPU cycle. And sometimes games would be unplayable. Sometimes you just get weird symptoms and stuff like DirectX 9 has mitigated or eliminated like weird technical issues like that as well. I don't have too much else to say other than this is an issue that has almost completely went away because of some utilities like DOSBox, but also how easy it is to make virtual machines. You, even if you're just a little bit tax savvy, you can watch a YouTube guide on how to make a Windows 98 or Windows XP virtual machine to play and run an older game in. If it doesn't run on modern hardware or there's not been some type of remaster re-release. Now we get to console first design. And again, some of this is going to be opinion, but as they say, the proof is in the pudding. There are some games and examples I'm going to bring up of clearly console limitations applied to computer games. First, I want to start off that I don't think it's a coincidence that one of the most prominent channels focused on PC gaming on early YouTube was John Bain, a.k.a. Total Biscuit. Uh, he started his internet career being a StarCraft shoutcaster as well as covering World of Warcraft. He quickly gained traction with his WTF Is series where he would give a first impression almost exclusively on computer games. Now, part of that series, as it started to get its legs and he really developed into what it was going to become, was he would cover all the options and settings of a game. 
and it was kind of a joke with him and his community. He would have a 30 minute video. The first 10, sometimes 15 minutes would just be him going through like the settings of the game. And I do think that is a reflection of the console first design that had been going on for about a decade before this. Be the reason he made such a point to go over all these settings was there were so many games that were being ported or coming to PC that were just lacking so many basic options that, especially 10 years prior, you would have options and all these adjustments you could make, but then they just went away. And that was that clearly is just an oversight or a lack of caring about the user experience when it came to the PC platform. Other examples of the console first design is when it came to like UI and controls. So this is a little bit after what I consider the dark age, but one of my go-to examples of, because it happened in 2016, which at this point, kind of a long time ago, but for a while didn't seem that long ago, but Fallout 4, uh, if you play that game on PC, again, if you're like me, you're playing it mouse and keyboard, mouse and right hand keyboard, WSD, if you're right-handed, and one of the most frustrating things about that game was by default, you use the enter key to like accept and play stuff. So especially if you're doing base building to like scrap stuff or uh, to play stuff, a ba essentially like a lot of repetitious uh, actions, you had to drag your hand across the keyboard. And it sounds little and it is little, but that's what almost makes it more frustrating. It's like, why are you not designing this to allow me to accept with my right hand? Why do I have to either drag the mouse and click or move my hand across? Like I should be able to like, you know, recycle, recycle, place, place, place. And you see radical menus in some games where the UI in the past, especially if you're playing on PC, radical menus are great if you're on a controller, but if you're on a PC, it's almost always quicker and easier to hit tab and click what you need and use the mouse. And essentially, there are just options and controls on UIs that went away. Sometimes you just had no key binding or very little key binding you could do. I go back to Resident Evil 4. The first release of that game, you had to aim with the controller. So when you'd like pull out your gun to aim, use the arrow keys. Uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Not the controller, you'd aim with the arrow keys. That <laughs> was ridiculous. Luckily, that was fixed. I, they did like a re-release of that game later. And this isn't even touching on all the famously bad PC ports. You had Dark Souls, GTA San Andreas, Resident Evil 4 again, Saints Row 2, Splinter Cell Double Agent. The list goes on. I, I'm not just going to hit sit here and ramble off bad PC ports. Again, not the point of this, and I could go on for days. A lot of this period, that was just the life of it. A game, when it came out to PC, e if it even was announced to come out on PC, the next thing you're worried about was, is it going to be a good port? Am I going to be able to have key binds? What's the UI going to be like? Again, luckily, I think as the eighth generation of consoles released, a lot of that type of stuff started to go away, and we started to get back to mostly good PC ports. And a lot of options especially from the backlash of the PC gamer uh, crowd. A lot of these companies started to listen and bring back options as well as consoles got more powerful. So they could take advantage of these options that particularly if they're graphical and add them into the game for PC gamers to adjust up and down and customize to their heart's content. The la last part of console first design and what I do think will get some people a little bit, uh, annoyed or angry is what I view as mass appeal. Now this is by far the biggest thing I'm making assumptions on and I don't have any direct proof and I'm not saying this is definitive, but there are plenty of games people point out as examples or specifically series such as Elder Scrolls, Fallout, Deus Ex, Gothic, SimCity, Dragon Age, The Sims. These are games Early in the series, you could argue had more depth and interesting concepts and game mechanics. As the series went on, a lot of those features were re removed. 
And some of these series, if not most of them, often started on PC. They were PC exclusive. So this isn't anything like against console games. This is more talking about when a company makes a very successful game or new IP and they want to obviously sell it to as many people as they can. And there is and there's truth to it. Uh when you make stuff with a lot of depth and mechanics, you do start to narrow down the market. And when you are releasing specifically uh on PC, there is a tendency to sometimes allow developers to get more nitty gritty. Because when you go for that multi-console, multi-PC release, there is an element of sometimes you want to just aim for the mass appeal. Get the lowest common denominator, and that sometimes means trimming the fat. Which, streamlining isn't always a bad thing. Uh, yeah, it sometimes can be, it sometimes can't. It's case by case. But I do think there is a discussion to be had that when games were... Uh, more focused they had a smaller audience but they were often a more interesting game or sometimes a better game once they got that mass appeal uh they got a little less little more boring and i tie this in with console first design because when you start to release a game on every platform that can be part of that uh, strategy. You're trying to get the most people to play the game. Now that, uh, again, by no means means if a game comes on PC, Xbox, PlayStation, Game, or not GameCube, Nintendo, uh, Switch, or whatever, that it is going for mass appeal. There's clearly games that have a lot of depth and mechanics. There's series that continue to get uh, more complex as the next iteration comes out that this isn't true on. And that's why I'm not trying to make this as a blanket statement. But I do think if you look at all games, clearly there will be a few where there's a boardroom of directors. And this might be more to talk about how games are designed than specifically consoles or console design. But there's 100% been times when games are being designed and it's like, listen, we're taking this from a PC exclusive. We need it to go on the all the consoles that are out at the time which means we need to add these limitations or we want people to we don't want to scare away the casual audience so we need to streamline and trim some of the fat and i do think there are examples of that happening uh some games like some of the older elder scrolls uh when it came to like borrowing and stuff you still had all these like damage types and weapon types and some of that went away games like days x I still like the newer ones, but like the original Days X was just like a masterpiece of a game, had a lot more like interesting stuff going on, complexity. Even games like Gothic, one of my favorite games ever, Gothic 1 and 2. Uh, Gothic 3, <laughs> awful game. But then when Gothic 4, which turned into, what was it called, Arcana 4 or something, or just Arcana, uh, that was really sent consoles and when they did that that game just mechanically again had a lot of the legs take out from under it so games coming out on consoles isn't necessarily a bad thing but i do think it's something uh you have to consider is is this coming on consoles because they just want to sell more games and have more people experience it or specifically if this was a pc game that now is being really sent everything is it now just they're going for mass appeal and they're willing to make a less interesting game to sell more copies overall. It's Filbert. I'm jumping in after I record most of the video. And as I was going through editing, I did kind of want to highlight a little bit of what I also mean by this was the dark age of PC gaming. And I'm going to do this by pointing out some of the biggest games and series of uh, PC games in the nineties and a couple of the biggest studios that when you think uh, PC gaming, especially classics, these are the games you think of. And most of these games and studios either died off in this era or died during it. And that was partially because of reasons I've talked about in the video. It's also just the nature of the industry. Some of these small studios often got bought by bigger developers like EA Activision, whatever, and they 
killed the studio or just bad decision making. I'm going to go through a list of a few. Uh, first, we have Duke Nukem. Some of the early Duke Nukem games, especially Duke Nukem 3D, considered one of the best PC games of the 90s. You go until from 96 Duke Nukem 3D to Duke Nukem Forever in 2011, which was very poor received by most people. Thief series. the In the 90s, the first two Thief games are classics, loved. You had Thief Deadly Shadows come out in 2004. That was mixed by a lot of people because it did change up the game quite a bit. And then we didn't get anything till 2013. So almost the entire era, you got one game that wasn't necessarily loved by all the fan base. You then had the famous Unreal series, Unreal uh, Tournament. And the first one, 2003 and 2004, I know everyone was playing back then, but that quickly fell off too. Unreal 3, Terminate 3 came out and really no one touched it. And then uh, I think, did a 4 ever come out? Or if it did, it was like canceled. I mentioned it a bit. Fallout, the first two Fallouts, amazing games, people really enjoy them think they're awesome and i do like the modern fallouts three new vegas even four four i think it's a good game not a good fallout game uh but they're way different if if you it is perfectly valid if you love the first two fallout games to not like the second ones they are a completely different game in almost every aspect of being a game and yeah fallout the series ended the classic fallouts that we know ended in the late 90s. And when it came back with Fallout 3, if that wasn't your cup of tea, uh, that old series you liked is just no longer a- around. We have to, of course, touch on Doom. Um, and some of these, like Doom is a good example, aren't necessarily were PC games. They got started on PC, uh, which is kind of why I'm highlighting them. But You have Doom and Doom 2, again, classic shooters, basically built the genre. Uh, Doom 3, again, mixed game. It came out in 2004 and essentially put the series on hold until Doom 2016, well after the Dark Age. The Command and Conquer games, one of my favorite series, uh, whether it's Command Conquer, Red Alert, uh, Tiberian Sun. You had through the 90s and early 2000s, all the classics come out. But then after Generals came out in 2003, the series just kind of went downhill. I still have a soft spot for uh, Siberian Wars 3, I think is good. And Red Red Alert 3 is okay. I do think it gets really campy and really silly. It did give us Tim Curry in Red Alert, so it's worth it just for that. Commander, you've rained on my glorious parade. For this, I'm sending everything I've got at you. But I won't let you have the satisfaction of catching me. I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! Those weren't necessarily the direction people wanted the gameplay to go in. And then Red Alert 3 is the last Red Alert we got in 2008. It got a couple expansions the year after. Then we had Tiberian Wars 4, which killed the series off. Until we did finally at least get the remastered collection in 2020, well after the Dark Age. War of Warcraft, another classic PC game. The first two, I have so many great memories with the first one. Uh, But yeah, you had Warcraft uh, 3 come out, Reigns of Chaos, 2002, right before the Dark Age, or right when it started. It got an expansion. Then Warcraft, as far as an RTS, just went away. You did get WoW, and I never really got too... I played a little bit of WoW as an MMO, but never got that far into it. Uh, And if you loved it, that was a highlight during the Dark Age for some people, some of the MMOs that came out, especially the early ones. But as far as the RTS, it just went away. Going to another amazing 90s RTS, Age of Empires. The first two games, amazing games. Age of Empires 3 comes out. And not that it was a bad game. It came out in 2005. It was just not nearly as well received as the rest of the Age of Empires. 
and it kind of caused the series to go on hiatus. They end up doing uh, remasters and did definitive editions of the games way after the Dark Age or at the end of it, 2013. The series has since come back with Age of Empires 4 in 2000 or 2021. I like it. Great game. Glad it's back. But again, during that Dark Age, you Age of Empires kind of got pushed to the back burner. Starcraft, another classic 90s game. You did have Starcraft 2 come out during the middle of the Dark Age, maybe the height of it. Great game. But again, a series that was kind of, it got a ton of love with this release and hasn't been really uh, given expansion or hasn't been given sequels and has, as the Dark Age went on, pushed more and more to the back. By the end of the Dark Age, Starcraft. It's always stuck around as uh, E-Tournament and stuff, but it's nowhere near what it used to be. Quake, another classic games in the 90s. It's kind of on repeat at this point. It had Quake 4 come out in 2005. Was not necessarily a bad game, but was no nowhere had the hold and the development that the earlier ones had, and it essentially went on hiatus. Quake still exists in some form. There's Quake Champions, and they've done like remasters and releases, but it's nowhere near like it was before. SimCity, another series. SimCity, SimCity 2000, 3000 were awesome classic games. You had SimCity 4 come out in 2003 during what I consider the Dark Age. Great game, amazing game. But then it got no love for nine years and at the very end of the dark age we get some city 2013 that everyone just didn't like it had so many issues i still stand by there is a core of a good game but it has so many issues whether it was part of it it's always online to how small the cities are a couple broken things that it <laughs> we just got one game over a decade and the sequel at the very end of the Dark Age killed the series. And quickly to touch on, I when I think 90s PC, I think of like Black Island Studios. I think of Interplay. I think of Maxis. And these are all studios that were making some of my favorite games that all died at the start or during the Dark Age. Maxis technically survived most of it, but... Maxis has not been Maxis since the late 90s, early 2000s. Ever since, you know, the 2000s came out, they essentially started making just The Sims, though I do still like Sims 1, 2, and 3 a lot. 4 is okay. The only thing they ever did after that was Spore, which was okay, and then SimCity, which essentially killed the studio. Maxis, as far as I know, exists like in name only. Uh, so I want to throw that in just to kind of highlight uh, part of what it was like going through the Dark Age. Of You had these great games, great companies and developers. A lot of are like the pinnacle. Like when we think uh, classic PC game, 90s PC game, these are the games and developers you think of. And they, a lot of the series and IP either died or during most of the stretch was on like life support and we got nothing or what we got was a bit of a shell compared to what came before. And I just think, so I want to give that perspective along with everything else I've said of what made this age frustrating and sometimes disappointing as a PC. So my final conclusion, I've mentioned a couple times, I think the end of the dark age of PC gaming started to occur around 2013 as the eighth generation of consoles were released. And the cynical part of me, but also the most practical part of me, thinks it mostly came down to money. In 2008, PC gaming was roughly at 9 billion sales. In five years, that had almost doubled to 17 billion. And as I said earlier in the video, in 2002, that reached 38 billion. There was a period of time, especially in this age, you'd always hear people say, PC gaming's dead, PC game's dying. But it always continued to grow, and 
I think a lot of companies, developers, publishers, it's about making money when it, it's, and they seen the markets growing and we're getting from single digit billions, to double digit billions. They want to release games on PC, even if their game gets pirated 2 million times, if they sell 4 million copies, that's still a lot of money and that's money left on the table. And again, as I mentioned before, I do think two other big aspects to the end of this was digital marketplaces and whether you like them or hate them, it seems like consoles are trying to go that route too, but they allow an easy way to implement DRM that isn't nearly as intrusive to the consumer. And it's a very easy way for customers to buy the game, download the game, manage their library. And it just takes a lot of that in practical DRM off the table. Developers do not have to license through these third companies that do DRM. They don't have to go back to these old days of making these physical products or these complicated uh, algorithms for their CD keys. They can put their games on these storefronts and get sales. When it comes to playing older games on PC, it is so much easier. I, It's 2023. I can almost always go back and play games from 5, 10, even 20 years ago on my computer. It's really... Once I start get over 20 years, I run into issue, but, and you're obviously, obviously always are going to have games that have issues. Some games, when you go to a newer version of windows or newer hardware, they do break, but it is way less common than it used to be 20 years ago, even like 15 years ago, when going back to a windows 98 game era game or an early XP release game there's a good chance in a few years that was going to be so much harder to play once you got a new operating system, new hardware. How easy it is to get up a virtual machine if you have a little bit of tech savvy and a little bit of patience. You can essentially play any PC game on a modern system if you're willing to do a little bit of legwork. So those are my thoughts on the dark age of PC gaming. I am very interested i'm not just saying this like one of those people like let me know what you think down in the comments below i'm actually interested in hearing other perspectives so again i'm 34 i was a teenager to young adult during during most of this time i would like to know if you're like older or younger than me and you play games on pc like do you agree with me did you run into a lot of the issues or have some of the same experiences i have or how are they different I'm also very interested if you were a console player or or even if you still are a console player. Again, I play on console. It's not my primary method of playing games. If it is, are there aspects that are the inverse for you? I would, I honestly am interested to know if, especially this era, if you felt that PC was negatively influencing your console games or even positively, were, are you someone who, there's like the eighth, eighth generation of consoles hit. You've seen like influences of PC gaming come to console. Like one of the biggest ones I know is mods. Mods used to be PC only. Uh, granted, mods used to have more power, power and there more you can do on PC. But a lot of Bethesda games, you can now download mods through their creation tool thing, marketplace they run. So even like, I, I do think there are aspects of mods and whatnot that used to be exclusive to PC have possibly influenced console, but I'm interested to know the positives and negatives of either side of that. But uh, thanks as always for watching and listening and I'll catch you next time.